Hi, everyone. Welcome to another live event of the MIT MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management. I'm Miguel Rodriguez Garcia, a researcher at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, and I'm the course lead for SE1X Supply Chain Fundamentals. First, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is the second and final live event of the fall series, a series of cross-course live events for SE1X Supply Chain Fundamentals and SE3X Supply Chain Dynamics. And that's why I'm really happy to be co-hosting this live event with uh, my colleague, Paolo Sosa Jr., course lead of SE3X. Hi, Paolo. How are you? Hey, Miguel. How are you? Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. We are excited to share some great insights about supply chain in this live event today. Uh, and our agenda for today is the following. First, our guest speaker will give us a presentation that will last around 25 minutes. Then we will have some time at the end uh, when he will answer questions from the audience. So we encourage you to participate and use the Q&A feature in Zoom, uh, not the chat box, but the Q&A feature. And then Miguel and I will take those questions and channel as many as we can to our um, speaker. But before we introduce our guest speaker, we want to share some um, something with you all, right Miguel? Yeah, that's right, Paolo. So we just want to remind everyone that this event is part of the MITx MicroMasters program in supply chain management, a program that we develop here uh, at the Center for Transportation and Logistics at MIT. And as well as supply chain fundamentals and supply chain dynamics, uh, the MicroMasters program includes three other courses. Uh, so five courses in total, and some of them are currently open for enrollment. So don't hesitate to check them out. We'll be posting the link in the chat group in case you guys are interested in completing the, uh, the program, which of course we encourage you to do. So without further ado, uh, let's introduce, uh, introduce our guest speaker, Paolo. All right, so today we are honored to have Yashar Amadov as our guest speaker. Yashar is an industrial engineer with more than eight years of work experience in supply chain management. And he is currently a senior simulation data scientist at Amazon. He uses simulation, mathematical optimization, and data science tools to solve complex supply chain problems. These include network design, facility location, resource planning, inventory optimization, and scheduling, among others. Yashar holds a master's degree in supply chain management from MIT. He was part of the 2021 blended cohort. Um, he is also a MicroMasters alum, which means he passed all courses from the MicroMasters program like many of you are doing right now. Uh, we always like uh, to remind the audience that one among many other benefits from earning the MicroMasters program credential is that you become eligible to apply to the supply chain management blended master's program at MIT, just like Yashar did and to other universities around the globe. So welcome Yashar. Hello, um, thank you. Thank you, Paolo and Miguel. I'm happy to be here. And I greet all the um, all the people who are watching this live video event. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, so today we're going to dive deep into simulations and what they are used for, what are they good, and in which situations should we use simulations. So main, mainly I will focus on inventory, transportation, and system dynamics aspects of, of simulations. So here we go. The overview is what is simulation? And then I, I will talk um, about applications in inventory management, transportation system dynamics. And the most exciting part will be a live demo. And I, I will, my target is to show you that within a very short time frame, let's say five minutes, you can create a very visual simulation of your supply chain. And that's going to be um, the last part. So first of all, what are simulations? We hear this word a lot in different contexts, but it's a collection of methods and applications to mimic the behavior of real systems. We, it can be any system. Uh, supply chain is one of them, fulfillment networks, warehouses. And in this picture, you see the, the truck simulator. It is also a simulator because we are trying to mimic the behavior of some real systems. So a lot of things go under simulation. However, um, in this context, in supply chain, we're talking about industrial simulation. And why we do so? We want to 
uh, understand, predict the system's behavior, and evaluate various alternatives. So the word digital twin emerged in the last years, which means we have physical factories, we have ports, uh, we have vessels, trucks, warehouses, retailers, and so on. We want to create their visual representation and digital representation so that we can experiment on top of it. And the world is changing fast, the situation is changing fast, and we want some kind of tool that would let us to do what-if anal analysis. So th there are many different types of simulations within industrial simulations also. At uh, some point the, at the beginning when we did not have very strong computers, the simulations were mainly deterministic, meaning that there is no random variables inside that simulation. And whatever input you give, you always take, or you always get a unique output. On the other hand, we have stochastic simulations, which is the widely used in, in, in this domain. And here you can have random variables. And the beauty of having stochastic simulations is uh, we know that in real life, nothing is deterministic, right? Uh, one day we receive orders, maybe for a thousand units, the next day 1,100, the next day 900. It changes all the time between days, seasons, uh, weeks. The lead times are also stochastic. That's also one of the major things taught at MITx uh, MicroMasters in, in supply chain management. Uh, we have some kind of probabilistic distributions, most of the time we can approach it as normal distribution. And we want to optimize our policies, our resources under this probabilistic environment. So the lead time could be one week, eight days, five days, but it's never a, a stable number. And sometimes there are uh, static uh, simulations that have no time dimension. Um, for example, Monte Carlo simulations, this is also taught, you open an Excel file, generate some random variables and experiment on top of it. And like we, we mainly focus the ones that are stochastic, dynamic, that is the system behavior changed over time. Like we have, let's say, thinking of ocean transportation, we have vessels with a number of containers moving the state of the system changes every minute, every second. And the third dimension is continuous versus discrete. So continuous is system state changes continuous on a continuous basis. And discrete is basically you have discrete points in time and then that's it. It's um, There are some defined points that you jump from one state to another. An example of continuous System is an altitude of an airplane. And as long as it's flying, there is a number that's evolving. It goes up when we take off and landing, it goes down. And it can be zero when it's on ground for some time, but that's okay. It's also a continuous thing. Or discrete events like customers visiting a supermarket, right? The, the customers, if you try to take notes when they enter to the supermarket, it's, it's like, um, some points in time, this is discrete. So mainly the most advanced uh, methods focus on stochastic, dynamic, and continuous types of simulations. Okay, this brings us to the next slide. And in the world of industrial simulation, we have three paradigms, three different worlds. And this started with um, system dynamics and discrete event simulations, and this, type of discrete event simulations became very popular in the 90s and 2000 years. And now we have evolved a new stage where we have agent-based simulations. And I'm a big fan of agent-based simulation because it, it lets you model all kinds of complexity. So system dynamics, if you have a look at this chart, um, the y-axis, it goes from low abstraction to high abstraction, meaning that how detailed you want to model your system. When you're doing a modeling uh, system dynamics, that's at high level, uh, macroeconomic policies, 
the overall behavior of the system. You're on the top right corner. It's mostly continuous system, and you have a very high abstraction, and you have very less details. And discrete event simulations are located around this region. Um, they low you modeling average number of details, like you can model your warehouse um, operations, you can model your uh, port and trucks arriving and so on. And so the discrete event allows you within, let's say, a little bit above micro level until to mid level. And this was dominating for two decades. Now we have agent-based simulations, which let us model from a very low abstraction to a very high abstraction. It gives you basically the whole um, a bunch of opportunities. You can model the active objects, individuals, behavior rules, interactions between the different agents and models. And this is mostly um, what I, I prefer because of the flexibility that it gives me. Again, discrete event simulations were working like um, the model was scheduling discrete events, like the truck arrives, the time is equal to zero. It gets loaded at, at time is equal to one hour. So that's why it was called discrete event simulations. What are the advantages of simulation? There are plenty. Increased realism, existing or non-existing systems can be studied. Let's say you have a certain supply chain, but you want to transform it. You're going to buy from suppliers that maybe does not exist in your supply chain right now. Maybe you are going to get new customers that are not existing now. You can model both of them. Hazardous systems can be studied without risks. Bottleneck analysis, usually if you have read the, the book the, called The Goal, where the theory of constraints um, are explained, there the main idea is to find the bottleneck in your system, understand it better, make it lighter, you know, because bottleneck is the problematic part where which defines the throughput of our system. And you can do this in a digital environment. What if questions can be answered? Like for scenario analysis, you can say, what if I change this? What if I add a new warehouse? What if I get a new retail customer and so on? Results are reproducible as long as you keep, although it, it does a stochastic or probabilistic simulation, but as long as you keep the random seed the same, every time with the same inputs, you will get the same outputs. And one of the things that I love about simulations is their explainability. Nowadays, we have AI solutions, ML solutions, mathematical optimization solutions, and so on, right? Everybody is, now most of the people are using, for example, ChatGPT. When you ask, like, what is supply chain management, it generates an answer. But why does it use certain words, but not the others? Nobody can answer that because it is how it is trained based on the uh, data it has been trained and there is um, a complex neural network behind and it's really difficult to explain uh, complex models why they make certain decisions but not the other. So this always comes as a question uh, when using other types of solutions. But with simulations you can say hey and here is the truck, here is the customer and at that point in time this was the cheapest option that's why I chose this route, for example. Ease of communication with the management, especially with the help of animation. And this has helped me a lot when uh, talking to customers, to the leadership management. Like instead of um, like th some theoretical tables or data, you just open and show what's going on. There are also some cases where you should not use uh, simulation, right? If you can do with a common sense analysis, you don't need, there are some simple queuing systems in the literature, if you can use it like for, for drive-in restaurants and so on, uh, there is no need to set up, um, spend a lot of time and energy to build the simulation models. When you don't have resources, if you cannot validate or verify the behavior of the system, if you can't ex you can't meet the expectations of the project, you don't you should not overpromise or the system behavior is ill structured. So basically, nobody knows uh, what to expect from the system or how it behaves.
So this is as a, as a side note. And within this agent-based simulations, there are multiple providers. The one that I use is software called AnyLogic. It's written in Java and it offers GIS maps, space markup tools, 2D, 3D simulations, many industry-specific libraries for process modeling, material handling, pedestrian, rail, and road traffic libraries, fluid library for chemicals manufacturing, for example, and they also have um, a section called system dynamics where you can take it and use, right? So the conveyor system, for example, the transportation system, this is not unique to every company. Some things are generic and already these packages are created for you where you can just drag and drop and, and use them and spend your energy to fine tune um, the model towards the details of your system, the things that are not um, general or applies to everybody. For inventory management, typical tasks, demand forecasting, stock, safety stock optimization, order points, lead time, ABC analysis. Often when you're managing inventory, you use some kind of, again, probabilistic model. You can use, um, for example, economic order quantities. You can uh, use order use computations for order up to points or the minimum stocks. Again, you can compute things, but will it work in reality under the uh, probabilistic behavior of the system? So this is a good place to test what is going on and um, what is happening, and you can do scenario analysis. So one of the things that the COVID period taught us is that instead of forecasting the future, better way is to do scenario planning and prepare accordingly. What if World War III starts tomorrow, the, the worst case? And what if everything goes perfectly fine and uh, the interest rates again go down and you know the shipping rates are affordable? Uh, you can define certain number of scenarios and prepare accordingly. There, this is where um, the uh, simulation comes in handy. And again, for example, for uh, for the uh, the the warehouse simulations, and I, I do have some simple examples on on how to model this or or visual simulations. So as I said, this is a sample warehouse simulations. Here you have racks, you have employees, you have um, uh, forklifts, you have trucks coming in, uh, they bring goods for you and some of them, uh, these blue ones, they take and take it to your customers. And like here you can do a lot of different type of experimentation and um, you can change, for example, let's say you want to know how many forklifts you, you need you can change the, some figures from eight to nine and see what is their utilization factors and different number of employees. So it is helping you to make decisions on how many resources you need. This is usually the case when, make, when we need to make a decision on the resources, uh, we don't want to overshoot and also underestimate. So we, we're trying to find the golden mean, all right? And one of the examples that I like, the system dynamics, that's like a very high level uh, formulations. Um, they use this agent-based modeling to predict the COVID infections. And this is one example of, the, of that. And there were many proposals and there was not enough data to validate which systems give you the best projection to the future. And there were many different methodologies proposed and the agent-based simulations outperformed others in terms of like how many people um, are susceptible, they exposed, what is the infection rate, and they, if they get infected, how many of them get recovered, how, ma how many of them uh, lose their lives. And based on these system dynamic simulations, in, in the hindsight, now we see that the this type of agent-based simulations yielded uh, the most one of the most accurate projections on what's going on in transportation, traffic flow modeling, airport port operations, public transportation prep, traffic safety. Many things are possible by using um, um, simulations. Again, most of the simulation packages come with the GIS maps. 
which means they, that already contains the information about the railways, the uh, highways, and you don't need to guess the transit times. It, it already comes in a package. You just tell the origin and destination, and then it is going to tell you what's going on in the system. And for the, um, for the uh, system dynamics, again, supply chain dynamics, policy modeling, environmental systems, healthcare systems, and also the COVID analysis that I showed you are some examples of system dynamics. Right now, I will I will stop this and jump onto, uh, on, onto this uh, simulation uh, software just to show you that in, in a few minutes, in some minutes, you can create a, a simulation that is very visual and you, 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 it is basically once you master the basics, it's it, it will take you less and less time. Here is the question. Uh, I have one manufacturing site in Albany, New York. I have two distribution centers in Springfield, Massachusetts and Hartford, Connecticut. And I have two retailers in Boston and Providence. So the aim is to create the, the simulation of this small supply chain. So I pick these as as an example so and I, I will show you here on this software uh, i don't expect you to follow all the steps i'm gonna go fast just to show that it works and if you later want to follow i you can watch the recording or in a slow mode or uh, i can share some examples of of, of this step by step so uh the first thing here is i'm going to create a new model I'm going to call it supply chain simulator. And then I'm going to set the model time to hours. And it creates a blank model for me. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, to draw, um, to drag and drop the GIS map. So on, on the left side, there are different libraries that you can use. And one of them is space markup and there is GIS map. And this map, as I said, contains all the information about, um, you know, basically Google Maps, but it's coming from uh, OpenStreetMap provider. So it's a different provider, but um, it it already contains all the routes and highways, and you don't need to 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 tell what is the exact route. So in our example, we have one manufacturing site in Albany. So I'm gonna just double click and zoom on. Uh, around around Boston to to show it easily. And if I search Albany, uh, it's popping up here. I'm going to convert it to GIS map and and then remove all other elements. So this red point here, it's going to be our manufacturing facility. And then I will I will also locate to the others, the Springfield, Massachusetts, I'm gonna type Springfield, Massachusetts, and it's going to give me multiple options. So I'm gonna convert this also, which is located here, and then the remove all other elements. And here I will zoom it a bit to see better in this region. So here we go. And then the other one is in Hartford. I'm going to search for hard for it. And then the, the others, I'm going to remove all the elements. The next step is two retailers. One, let's say, in Boston, Massachusetts. And then I add it here and remove the others. Then the last one is, is in Providence. It gives me this option. I add it here and remove all the elements. Now I have all the all the nodes located here, right? This is going to be my manufacturing facility and these two are going to be my um, distribution centers and these two places are going to be my um, retailers. And once I do this, I can create uh, some kind of collection. Again, on the, on the left-hand side, you can create different collections and I will use one for manufacturing site location. Right, and it's going to include the um, the GIS point. 
And once we once I add it into this collection, it is uh, giving me to it the option to iterate over um, over this set. And then you can easily create other collections for um, the let's say um, distribution centers. Right, and then you can also select here. It's going to be other type. It's going to be a GIS point, and here I will add the distribution centers, which was in one was in Hartford, and the other one was in and Springfield. And then I will create another another collection for the retailer locations and I will add here the other two points which is Boston and I will put plus sign here I will add Boston and Providence now this this uh, map contains uh, most of the information I need if I run this simulation it's just gonna uh, stay there and no movement or anything per se but in then and now I need to tell uh, what this is going to look like. It's just plotted in the in the in the locations, and that's it for now. And then uh, now I need to create the actual agents for for different types. And in in this case, I will have uh, one manufacturing uh, site location manufacturing site. It's going to be a single. And let's select an animation for this. Let's call it uh, warehouse and then finish. Now, once we do this, uh, here we need to, to tell the, the model where it's located. It is located in a node and it's called, it's located in, in Albany. Now, if I rerun the simulation, it's going to, to pop up in the right place with the right animation, right? You see the factory sign here, which means um, everything is fine. I need to, to do the thing for the other two. I need to create uh, the respective agents for the population agent, new agent, and then this is going to be the um, distribution center. And then uh, it's going to have also 2D animation. I'm going to use this warehouse and then finish. And then these are also going to be located in in the node and that node is defined by the collection here which is distribution center location dot get index so this is going to put in in the right place initial number of agents and this is going to be um, this many dot size and when I run it now, so we, we got these two also located here. And last uh, last one is the, the retailer part. I need to, to do that also. I put here and I'm going to collect population of agents. These are going to call uh, retailer. And then next, it's going to be a retail store sign and then finish. I will do the same thing here. Contains this this mm, retailer, we have two of them right now, retailer location dot size, which means it will take it from there and they are located in the node. And this is going to be uh, retailer location dot get index. Right now, if, uh, if I do this, it's going to also plot the last piece. I have only one thing to create, the trucks, and then um, I'm going to finalize just to show you how it moves. Now on the map, we see um, all our nodes. Uh, right now, I need to also create um, the, the, the trucks. And for that, I will go to the main palette and then uh, bring agent here. And it's going to be population of agents. It's going to be used in flowcharts, and this is called truck. I will select um, a sign from here, which is this one next, and it will have uh, a, a client which is of type 
manufacturing centers will send to distribution centers and then finish, right? And right now we we can create the initial number of agents, let's say uh, 100, and it's it's going to be um, um, the the trucks. If I if I run this over, uh, we see we see the truck also located here, but it's huge, so we need to to make it make it smaller. I will go to the truck section and then reduce. The uh, the scale I will put maybe 0 0.5 0 0.5. Then at the end this is how, this is how it's going to to look like the simulation. And if I run this, we will see that all the all the the trucks are moving in the in the in the right direction. So when you create the truck agent, select them. Here is our manufacturing facility. These are the two distribution centers, and these are the retailers. Now, with just a few commands, I was able to create this simulation, right? And I don't care about the roads and so on. The trucks are already following the actual routes between the cities. And why is this beautiful? Because it's easier to communicate, it is visual, and there are tons of things that you can add. This was the thing that I did in just five or six minutes, but you can you can add tons of other things on top of this, um, different types of KPIs, visualizations, and um, any type of thing, like time stack charts, plots, bar charts, histograms. You can use entire library for system dynamics, for car library, there is an entire thing designed for you here. And for example, for uh, warehouses, conveyor, you don't need to define, it's already here. You you dra drag and drop this con conveyor object and tell what is the size, what is the speed, and so on. Here, I finish my part. Now it's the Q&A session. That's correct. Thank you so much, Yashar for walking us through so many examples of applications of simulation and supply chain management, and also for um, sharing this live demo, which is great. I'm pretty sure the audience appreciate this as well. By the way, we have a great audience today. We have many questions and we will share some of those right now. I want to encourage you, if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature uh, and we will channel it to Yashar. So let me start with two questions. The, the first one I can take myself. So. Are there, Adi is asking, are there any MITx classes that focus on supply chain simulation and optimization? The answer to that is yes, we do have. So you have content on SC0x, supply chain analytics. You have content on SC2x, supply chain design, and also SC3x, supply chain dynamics. We cover optimization and simulation content there. So feel free to enroll in one of the links that Emma is sharing right now in the chat. And the, the question that is addressed to you, Shar, so Daryl Fernandez is asking, what skill sets do you recommend we concentrate to learn in order to have a career in supply chain simulation field? And he's also, uh, uh, and the learner is also asking about tools that we should be well-versed to be relevant in this field. Yes. So the simulation tools that I use as of now uh, Java, they are based on Java programming language. You don't need to be an expert, just understand uh, how it works, the object-oriented programming, how you create classes and basic syntax. And there is a software that I use today, it's called AnyLogic, but you can also look at the market if there are other agent-based simulation providers, you can speak to any one of them, but the ones that I prefer is AnyLogic. And the thing is, I've tested this in, in very complex environments, right? Today, I had just one manufacturing, two uh, distribution center, and two retailers. What if I had hundreds of suppliers, thousands of delivery stations, and millions of customers? So this, this methodology would work in that case um, from my experience. But the other types of approaches don't work because when it's too complex, it takes you like 40 hours to run the whole simulation, which nobody is willing to wait for. So my answer for this, I needed the basic Java and this specific software called AnyLogic, and you should understand how object-oriented programming works. 
All right. Thank you so much for uh, your answer, Jashar. I, I I believe that uh, your answer actually um, is related to one of our learners' questions. Uh, Mario Lavarello was asking about the agent step, and I think this is kind of like related to the uh, to what you just mentioned. Uh, so maybe if you can explain a little bit better that step when you relate the agents to nodes uh, and also, for example, to the tracks, like to the different uh, elements in the simulation, because uh, some of our learners are still uh, wondering sure. like what sure, that means. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the very basic thing, you're probably, if you are familiar with programming, you know the difference between functional programming and object-oriented programming. If you're not familiar, in very basic words, in, in Java, for example, you create objects. And ob objects here, you see the distribution center it is an object. It has certain parameters and certain behaviors. And manufacturing site is another agent, and it has its own behavior. In other simulation paradigms, like discrete event or functional programming, you don't have this concept of objects. You create a function, for example, a truck movement function, and you define there. But here, at high level, you create a truck agent, and inside it, you define what's going to happen with this. So object-oriented programming takes this idea and applies it to here. Let's say I have a manufacturing site. Right now, I have not modeled anything inside this. But let's say you have a 1,000 manufacturing sites, and they have certain production process going in. So the good part of this is when you double click inside the manufacturing site, you can define what is going to happen with this agent. The same with the with the trucks, lorries, distribution centers. Let's say inside the manufacturing, you you have certain um, let's say um, uh, orders arriving. Then you put a source block here. Right now, it generated random demand, so just random numbers. But if you have a certain demand pattern and you have certain processing times, and inside this manufacturing site agent, you can define what is going to happen with it. Again, you can have thousands of them, and their processing times can be different. That's totally fine. You can define this inside your manufacturing site agent. and. Then, for example, you have some resource pools. You can drag and drop and say, hey, I have here associates and their, uh, for example, the, the capacity, which means the number of associates I have in warehouse, it's 100. They have certain schedule um, of, of um, working. You can define inside these agents what is happening. So some of these come with... Uh, pre-built behavior, like the truck actually, it has origin and destination, it moves in between these two. So um, the, when I create the, 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 the truck agent, it has this idea that it needs to move from origin and destination and put I put their origin as our manufacturing site and destination is randomly selected between our um, distribution centers and then they, they start moving in between. So this is the um, the strength of the object-oriented uh, programming, where you define the high-level agent, and then inside of the agent, you can define what they are going to do, how are they going to behave. Yeah, thank you so much, Yes, I think that clarifies a lot of our learners' uh, questions. So yeah, I appreciate it. Paolo, you want to take the next? Yes, we have one more here. So many can then is asking, what are the common pitfalls that we need to avoid while making the simulation. And I know that you already um, told us in what situations we should not apply the simulation, but assuming yeah. that we start a simulation, what would be the common pitfalls to avoid? Yeah. So new uh, practitioners, usually when they start working on a project, they think that I can model the whole complexity from the first shot. And if you have a very complex supply chain, my suggestion is start simple, like a very build a very small prototype that you that it works, and then you can add complexity as you move forward. And at each step, you need to test whether the system behaves as it should do. 
And for example, here it's visual. If the trucks are going in the correct direction, it means they are behaving correctly. And sometimes when you do this, like you, you can have logic errors. If we are, none of us are like perfect. We make mistakes. Uh, here you need to be able to debug what's going on wrong, wrong. But you need to do it incrementally instead of um, doing everything at once and then getting maybe hundreds of errors here. If I put something illogical here, it's going to throw an error. And when you do this with a complex system, you get a list of, let's say, 50 errors and welcome, uh, how, how are you going to, to debug that, right? This is one thing. And then uh, try to communicate with the stakeholders. People want to know how, they, they don't want you to treat it, this system as black box. You need to give them visibility on how your uh, system is working and uh, talk, somebody is, will be consuming your results, your model runs and so on. Stay in, in close touch with them, communicate and get approvals like, sign offs that this is what they're expecting. These are the two main things um, that I would suggest. Awesome. Great recommendations. Thank you so much. Miguel, do we have time for one more? Yeah, uh, maybe one or, or, or two. And um, let's see, I, I can do the next one. Um, and then we, we can decide because we have a lot of questions. So thank you so much to all our learners uh, and the audience for bringing every, uh, all those uh, like super nice questions, but we are not going to have time to answer them all. <laughs> Uh, so I think one that is really interesting is because um, we've talked a lot about simulation, but we we all know, and you mentioned it, uh, Jashar, that a lot of the times simulation uh, also is done together or, or in parallel with optimization or, or you simulate and then you optimize or whatever. So uh, when you have high uh, variance, like, uh, I don't know, what tools do you use or what's the process to actually merge uh, and put together simulation plus optimization? Yeah. Um, so these are the set of tools, right? Uh, AI ML is a, is a set of tools of mathematical optimization, and it has also sub branches like mixed integer linear programming, pure linear programming, nonlinear programming, dynamic programming, which they also offer a lot of tools for you. And this simulation is another type of tool. Now you. It might be that the, if somebody comes to you with uh, one terabyte of data and they are asking for insights, they are pur purely hinting at a data science-based solution. If somebody brings you uh, some fixed uh, demand figures and uh, transit times and let's say um, the supply capacities and is asking you what is the cheapest way of fulfilling this demand, this is clearly a mathematical optimization problem. Simulation is not, it has its own domain. So if you have limited number of options to set, to test, simulation is the way to go. But if you have billions of different options, simulation can't really tell you which one is the best. So depending on the ask, you need to find out which is the right tool to use. But they are used in conjunction with each other. Let's say you build a supply chain, you optimize your very complex supply chain. And then you want to validate it with simulation, right? Usually, um, complex optimization problems, they use mainly deterministic ones, like mixed integer linear programming, where they say, my demand is 1,000 tons and supply is 2,000 tons. There is usually no variability because it, it would take like um, ages to optimize um, a, um, a stochastic system in that way. So you can take that optimal network create different scenarios and test if it is really um, answering your, your needs. Might be that if the demand goes up by 10%, your supply chain is gonna explode, right? Nowadays, we also want to model the uh, weather disruptions like strikes and lots of things going on in our supply chain. It's not a flat and, and you know, many things can happen. You can test different scenarios with simulation. Some people use uh, machine learning uh, to feed the parameters of the simulation, right? Inside the simulation, you need to make a decision, for example, which supplier to choose. They have a machine learning model. They connect it to each other. And every time the simulation needs to make a decision, it calls that API and it responds like, in this situation, this is the best way to go. 
so yeah, um, you can use in, in conjunction with each other uh, these different methodologies. Well, thank you so much, Jashar, uh, for, for the answer, uh, and of course, for, for being here. Uh, we're going to wrap it up now because it's been uh, 50 minutes. It's been a super insightful session, uh, but we want to be really respectful with everybody's time. Um, again, thank you so much to everybody, uh, everybody who decided to join us today um, to learn more about simulation and how it can solve really complex problems in supply chain. Uh, in particular, I think that the overview of the types of simulations at the beginning, the discussion of when to use and when not to use simulation, and, and also bringing that real uh, example, uh, it, it was great. Uh, I think uh, everybody uh, got a really nice understanding of, of this uh, simulation and supply chain management. So um, I would say that uh, before uh, saying goodbye, uh, this was the last live event of the fall series. And that Paul and I co-host. So it's been a pleasure to share this experience with you guys. And second, as we mentioned before, several SEX courses are still open. Uh, for those completing SE1X and SE3X soon, it's going to be uh, important to know that SE2X and SE4X are going to uh, open right after the Christmas holidays. So you guys can take a break uh, during that special time, recharge your batteries, and then continue your path to complete the MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management. It's going to be January 3rd when the, both courses open, uh, if I remember correctly, so we encourage you to, to check them out. Again, thank you so much to everyone. Uh, of course, thank you, Paolo, for co-hosting this with me. Thank you, Jashar, uh, so much for joining. If you want to share any final uh, words, the floor is you guys. Yeah, um, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Thank you both. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Thanks to our audience. I just want to remind that this um, session will be uploaded to CTL's YouTube channel. Have a great week. Have a great time. Thank you so much, everyone.